Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here again with you all to discuss social, cultural, historical activity perspectives with you. And uh, we are very pleased to have today Julie and Paul with us. I thank you so much for joining us in this, this seminar and having the opportunity to discuss the way you you organize research, you act, you, you practice uh, your perspectives in, in, in the kind of activities that you create in, in your research. So I'm very, very glad and I'm very, I mean, honored to have you here. And I thank Larissa very much because as we have said here before, this is not an activity that I organize alone. It's organized by a group of, of people, of uh, students, ex-students that are now part of my postdoctoral and uh, activities. And today, Larissa is the person in charge of this discussion, just like Daniela, Viviane, Monica, Valau, and other people were in previous meetings. So I thank you, Larissa, and all the guests. So the floor is yours. Okay, um, well, thank you. Oh. Paul, before, yes. before you start, can I present to you and Julie? Sorry. Sure. Okay. Uh, I just want to say that I'm so, so happy to have both of you here. Um, so I'm going to make a kind of a formal presentation, but it's going to be quick. Um, Dr. Julie Hengst is an associate professor emerita of speech and hearing science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She works with social historical theories and situated discourse analysis and researches everyday communicative interactions in order to contribute to reshaping clinical practice. Fun facts. Julie has taught EFL in Saudi Arabia. She has a great sense of humor, is driven to community building, and has taught me to be unapologetic, which I'm still learning. <laughs> Um, Dr. Paul Pryor is a professor in English and the Center for Writing Studies, an interdisciplinary academic unit in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the same university. He works with cultural historical activity theory, actor network theory, and dialogic semiotics, through which he explores connections among writing, talk, embodied action, learning, and disciplinarity. Fun fact. <laughs> Paul has also taught EFL in Saudi Arabia. He has also a great sense of humor and is a great player and co-creator of Cindy Magic. <laughs> they are brilliant and caring scholars who I admire dearly. So I'm delighted to have them with us in this seminar. Thank you, Larissa. That was a lovely introduction. And thank you, um, Fernanda and Larissa and all for the invitation to join you today. I'm gonna to share a screen here in just a second. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Okay. Um, so uh, oh, what we're gonna do- me. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I just forgot to tell people about the interpretation. Just a second, ok? Mm -hmm. sure. Gente, quem precisar ouvir em português, é só mudar o canal na interpretação, ok? Então tá, e se você estiver assistindo a gente pelo Facebook e quiser participar aqui para poder ouvir em português, manda uma mensagem no, nos comentários e a gente passa no individual o link para o Zoom. Um, okay, thank you. And um, thank you again for the invitation. Um, there are two articles that we shared um, to, to focus the discussion today. Um, this is the citation for the two articles. Um, we also chose them because they're both available open source, which makes it nice that everyone can access them. Um, what we're going to do is to uh, go through some slides uh, and talk a little bit about the articles and some related notions and the connections between our work and then um, open it up for discussion. And, and we've been looking at the questions that were posted before the uh, session. Okay, so let me see, there we go. Um, first, we wanted to say a little bit about like why Julie and I are together. 
um, because I'm in an English department, she's in speech and hearing sciences. So just a little bit situating us. Um, we met as undergraduates at Indiana University in 1975. Julie was studying linguistics and semiotics and I was studying Arabic and then did a master's degree in applied linguistics. After we got married in 1979, we taught EFL in Saudi Arabia for two years, um, explaining Larissa's uh, mention of our time there, and then returned to the University of Wisconsin where Julie did her MA in communication disorders and began working in hospital settings with adults, particularly after brain damage. I was teaching English for academic purposes at Madison. I then went and did a PhD in curriculum and instruction second languages and cultures education at the University of Minnesota. And in 1992, I started on faculty in English in the Center for Writing Studies. Um, Julie then pursued, pursued her PhD in communication and then joined the faculty in speech and hearing sciences at UIUC in 2001. Julie's research has focused on the communicative practices of individuals with acquired neurogenic, neurogenic cognitive communication disorders, particularly aphasia and, and to lesser extent amnesia and their routine interlocutors. On clinical interventions for such individuals, including use of AAC as the article today discussed, and on situated and distributed communicative practices, verbal and nonverbal. My research has focused on literate activity, particularly in academic settings and writing in the disciplines and EAP teaching, and on situated and distributed communicative practices, um, verbal and nonverbal. In spite of our different disciplinary homes and different domains of practice, and maybe because we share the same home in our lives, we have both oriented to work on situated discourse, Goffman and um, Eleanor Oakes, for example, um, especially to dialogic semiotics, the work of Bakhtin and Voloshinov, and to cultural historical activity theory defined broadly, Vygotsky, Luria, but also Hutchins, Rogoff, Engstrom, Wirtz, Gonzalez, Ray, and we have frequently co-authored and co-edited publications and shared graduate mentoring over the past two decades. So in the article that Anna Smith and I um, published in LCSI and that we shared today, um, we talk about a flat chat perspective on transliteracy's development. And in there, we begin by talking about two architectures for understanding both human activity and human becoming. One is, is Neoplatonic and the other we describe as flat. Neoplatonic accounts are idealized and purified, desituated, disembodied, and dehistoricized, and involve government from above and beyond. Um, a good example of uh, this type of an account would be Chomsky's classical theories of language, where the sentence node magically creates sentences and noun phrases and verb phrases and things like that. And the goal is explicitly to just you know, deal with the idealized nature of a language, the ideal speaker and hearer. Um, flat chat assemblage uh, focuses on concrete, situated, embodied history um, activity and involves flat assemblage in the moment rather than government. In ethnomethodological and phenomenological contexts, um, you know, Garfinkel classically talked about imagining people as cultural dopes you know, puppets pulled by the strings of the culture or the social group. And a flat chat assemblage rejects that as ethnomethodology and phenomenology have. In particular, we link what we think is a radical argument from Voloshinov that language is a purely historical phenomena. To rhizomatic accounts of material semiotic phenomena, uh, Deleuze and Guattari, Latour, Karen Barad, and to chat, um, Vygotsky, Cole, Scribner, Engstrom, Del Rio, Alvarez, Gonzalez, Ray, and Wersch. Um, from my perspective, once you take that account of Voloshinov seriously, once you take a concrete material historical perspective, then you can no longer have some transcendent social force driving human interaction. We have to account for it in the flat plane of, um, of actual concrete human activity. Um, and how society operates then has to be translated into that plane and spin out from it. Um, we resist these neoplatonic uh, purifications of the social. And one thing is we talk about how ideas like discourse communities and speech communities, but also Jim G's big D discourses, um, you know, Leib and Wenger's communities of practice, 
and um, Engstrom's activity systems are also typically purified and idealized around conduit and container tropes. The structuralist imaginary of macrosocial norms and rules that somehow govern individual performance, a kind of dominant political ideology of nationality, which Mary Louise Pratt um, in 87 described wonderfully as linguistic utopias, no places. And from a phenomenological perspective, the stock of typifications that our language provide to name social institutions and groups. And it's interesting how often all of these different theorized approaches to the social end up naming things that we already have names for. <laughs> You know, this is a university, this is sociology, this is a classroom, this is a workplace. These are, um, you know, uh, particular types of accountants in the workplace and so on. Um, okay. And just to illustrate this a little more, and I know that a number of the questions have focused on this question of how we understand activity systems. Um, this is from Engstrom 2001. And um, I, I want to say generally to start that I think that the activity triangle is a fantastic tool for the change laboratory work that Engstrom and his many colleagues have done. Um, but we have issues with it. For example, if you look at the subject positions on each of these three triangles, it's always the subject is the institutionally authorized subject, hospital physicians, general practitioners, parents. Um, and the objects are always the ones who are asymmetrically you know, lower than that. It's always from the institutional perspective. Um, hospital physicians are not interchangeable human beings. Uh, they have gender, they have race, they have economic class, they have particular histories in politics, they have specializations, and they may have different, be differently abled. They could be um, blind, they could be deaf, they could be um, paralyzed in certain respects. So again, it's like, this is part of our concern with this kind of a visualization. To do an organizational intervention from this perspective makes sense. The interveners have been invited by the organization to deal with its institutional roles, but theoretically, ontologically, we think it misdescribes what's actually happening in any of these settings. Flat chat assemblage then focuses on becoming. Uh, lifespan becoming must be accounted for as embodied moments are dynamically accumulating and shedding from us, tracing what Fernando Gonzalez Ray called the collateral effects of living and ongoing human experience. Lovely line. The temporal continuities that move across time, space, and activity can also be illuminated by Bruno Latour's flat sociology of associations that localizes the global, seeing how it is located, that redistributes the local, seeing how it leads beyond this moment and this space and time, and that connects sites together, seeing chains of localities, events, things, and people woven together in trajectories. Uh, we talk in this piece about transliteracies, and this is just kind of a long quote about transliteracies. It was in a special issue that Anna and I, or a special section in LCSI that Anna and I um, co-edited on writing across and thinking about writing as something that doesn't just happen in a classroom, in the home, in the workplace, but as something that always is across in this kind of flap perspective. Um, Stoney Allo Smith and Phillips in 2017 articulated core principles of a transliteracy's perspective. Transliteracy shifts from traditional notions of literacies or literacy as a skill-based singular phenomena occurring in bounded context to more ideological understandings of literacies as multiple, multimodal, I would actually rather say semiotic than multimodal, but that's another conversation, mobile and constantly shifting in relation to broader social and cultural practices. For literacies in particular, they suggest the trans modifier offers a valuable ambiguity, be, ambiguity about what and how phenomena are moving, which provides conceptual and analytical space for tracing connections and boundaries, framing difference and disjuncture as a norm in the activity of creating, maintaining, and disassembling associations across space time. Uh, one thing is, if you look at the discussions of translanguage, translingual, transmodal, transliteracies, some of them have been movements from one place to another place, from one language to another language. Uh, another version of trans is actually kind of more like querying the categories, 
making the categories themselves break down and saying that, you know, English is not a thing. Portuguese is not a thing. Um, you know, law is not a thing. These are all kind of multiplicities that are, are woven together. Um, and we understand transliteracies from that perspective as not only a cross movement, but also as breaking the categories that are traditionally used in common sense discussions. Um, I've talked a little bit about a lifespan case study of Nora, um, our daughter, uh, Julie and, and my daughter, who was born when we were in Madison. Uh, she was a biology postdoc focusing on neuroendocrinology and behavioral display of social bonding and zebra finches in 2019. Um, she's now actually a senior research associate, associate in psychology at Cornell. So my research on her becoming a biologist and now a psychologist draws on life history, semi-structured and stimulated elicitation interviews, um, participant observation, uh, Julie's early videotaped observations of um, me playing pretend games with Nora and her sister, Anna, called Cindy Magic, which we've published on a lot. Julie's published on it starting in 99. A collection of texts that reach back to elementary school and continue up to the present. Um, okay, I didn't really mean to do that. And, uh, and memory, <laughs> my embodied memory of her. And I have here some other texts that um, are, are talking about this case study. As the article says on page four, um, my case study is finding that activities that have motivated, animated, and informed Nora becoming a biologist, now a psychologist, have been widely dispersed across her life, including childhood encounters with various popular science texts and artifacts, her home experiences with our family cats and dogs, family nature activities like bird watching, identification of plants, trees, and insects, kayak, uh, kayaking, hiking, uh, family pretend games, Cindy Magic. Um, just family talk around the dinner table, something that Oakes, Taylor, Rudolph, and Smith wrote very fascinatingly about in connection to their other research on physics, condensed physics labs at UCLA. Um, some particular school experiences were critical to Nora's becoming, particularly math in high school and her lab experiences in college. And other cultural activities, Nora repeatedly pointed to the important of her experience, importance of her experience with musical performance, um, she played piano, uh, uh, flute, uh, piccolo um, in school. At the center of Nora's trajectory of becoming a biologist and the chain of text that index that becoming, I see and have seen an affective and motivational orientation to animals and the emergent linking of that to disciplinary discourses and practices of biology. In specific in this piece, I trace Nora's professional vision as transliteracy's assemblage. Um, professional vision being something I take both from Charles Goodwin's uh, 1994 work on that, but also from Bruno Latour's work on um, seeing uh, soil in the forests of Brazil, as a matter of fact, um, and the ways in which that seeing was accomplished over time. I note that for her as an undergraduate field research assistant, um, she was engaged in seeing self-medicating red colobus monkeys in Uganda one summer. And that seeing them involved, you know, seeing individual monkeys in trees, recognizing them by attending to things like their tails and scarring on adult males. And that depended heavily, uh, especially in the first weeks on the expert knowledge of Ugandan field assistants, particularly Moses. Um, seeing African uh, cherry trees, which were the medical kind of part of, uh, you know, that, that they wanted to attend to in a forest of trees. And again, an accomplishment that depended heavily on field assistance. Seeing the behaviors of individual red colobus monkeys in a behavioral scanning assay. In other words, using sustained visual attention and filling out an observational protocol that particularly concentrated on the behaviors around the red uh, African cherry trees. Seeing, appropriately handling, storing, and transporting fecal samples because she had to collect the feces of um, the monkeys uh, from particular monkeys, mark it up, and then bring it back through O'Hare Airport in Chicago, which was fascinating. What's in that big uh, cabinet of uh, fecal samples from monkeys in Uganda? Hmm, <laughs> not sure about this. Seeing and reading inscriptions from the behavioral scans and linking them to the fecal sample labels, and then seeing particular parasites and microscopes 
which involved um, both smear and floating samples. Uh, however, in a short narrative interview, um, Nora, and this is on page six in the article, likens doing lab work to meditation and being in the moment, a regular topic in our family and in yoga classes that she was attending. And she recalled specifically conversations with Julie about possible careers when Nora was in high school and a specific day when we were birding um, with, uh, with me in Michigan. Uh, bird watching resonates with a complexly laminated assemblage of multiple histories. And um, Spencer Schaffner and I wrote about this in an ethos article in 2010, and here's a quote from it. Um, we choose, chose this one because actually in 2005, Errol Engstrom, when he was beginning to talk about wildfire activities, Notice like bird watching, which he thought was a crazy thing for people to do. But um, Spencer and I say that, you know, bird watching has long, deep histories. It's not a suddenly popped up thing. It includes the colonialist and capitalist projects of cataloging the Earth's resources for exploitation, the environmental conservation movement, the rationalist science of ornithology. Western sentimentalism over a fading national condition, human fascinations with creatures that fly in the air skies. Um, these are all diverse motives around bird watching that we said don't line up neatly each in its own lane, awaiting the starter's gun to begin, but are kind of mashed up together from the start in laminated assemblages. Nora is also indexing a longer set of trajectories she encountered through our family nature activities, like going out with kids and watching birds and identifying plants that sort of traces black to the late 1700s when suddenly there was an explosion of the sort of home natural history pedagogies and uh, books to support them, children's books on nature. Um, so uh, with that, I am going to switch over to let Julie talk a little bit about her piece. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, the article that I shared is called Mapping Communicative Activity, and it's taking up a chat approach to the design of pseudo-intelligent mediators, which I call PIMS, P-I-M-S, for augmentative and alternative communication, which I um, use AAC as the acronym. So this was a participatory design project and, and drawing on you know, longstanding traditions in artificial intel intelligence and assistive technologies. Um, this aligned with looking at the situated practices that we wanted these technologies to try to support or replace. So we pulled together a multidisciplinary team that included engineers, computer sciences, um, communication specialists, participant users, as well as disability specialists. Um, we were collaborating to develop communication technologies that would function as these pseudo-intelligent mediators or PIMs um, of interaction. We wanted to improve the communication between or among diverse communicators. For example, students on our campus who had and who did not have um, documented or visible disabilities. Um, by blending then the strengths of human mediators with features of digital AAC devices. So how do we blend um, what humans do well with what technology can do well? So this um, paper reports some of this initial phase of this participatory design process, which involved us developing a better model of everyday communicative activity across our university campus, and by collecting interactional data from young adults who could be potential AAC or PIN users. Okay, Paul. So in, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the term AAC. So just quickly, um, it's used in communication sciences and disorders or by speech language pathologists, speech therapists, um, to indicate those kinds of techniques or systems that will augment or stand in for face-to-face -face spoken language interaction. Um, interestingly enough, it generally has not included the kind of assistive technologies people use when they write or access the internet. So it's a gray area which for our purposes may or may not be that important. You know, professionally, it becomes an issue of what we call things for how we get funding for devices and get people services. But in terms of um, theoretically, I'm not sure that that's a very important division. 
but for the purposes, it is meant to support face-to-face -face interaction. Of course, historically, this would include anything from facial expression, expressions, gestures, symbols, pictures, alphabet boards, writing, and so on. Um, and that people with communication disorders often then rely quite heavily on such technologies or systems to augment spoken language. So AADC devices then are, are best understood as specialized assistive technologies, right? They're used by people to supplement or replace impaired speech abilities or spoken language abilities. Um, and they um, can be more general like communication boards as well as high end um, dedicated computer systems. So here we, there's a couple pictures here of people using these high end dedicated computer systems. And the one on the top, I imagine people recognize as Stephen Hawking, who's probably the most famous AAC user on the planet. Um, and there's a wonderful book I, um, that I can give you this, the reference for if you want it called Hawking Inc, which is um, essentially an ethnography of how his, how he um, has become, it, he, that she says like um, a head of a company creating this brilliant man that we've come to know. Um, so it's a fascinating read, um, but anyway, What's interesting from a clinical standpoint is despite these advances in the computerized or digital technologies, AAC devices still are, are quite strikingly underutilized. And even when people take them on are frequently abandoned by particular individuals. And indeed, you'll see that of all the people that were in our study, many had used AAC when they were younger and they've all abandoned them. So, <laughs> They do use assistive technologies for other things, but not for the face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and part of the reason is they're very poor at supporting the kind of complex dynamic character of face-to-face -face interactions. Okay, Paul. So the question for us was why? Why are they so bad at this? Um, and our arguments go back to the theoretical. We think that the limits of AAC are not simply technological. And in fact, the technology is, is phenomenal. But firstly, a question of theoretical frameworks. And this is on page six of the article. Um, so AAC, for example, traditionally has been grounded in prosthetic or biomedical models of devices and transmission or structural models of language or communication. They're designed to replace or augment, imagined as, as a replacement um, or an augment of an impaired body part or an impaired body function for an individual user. Um, they are also imagined as um, to try to optimize producing a linguistic message. So they become huge um, repositories of phrases and words and um, um, the user then is able to access those and put them together. In a very limited way, they're, they've proven to be quite successful. And I think Stephen Hawking's is a beautiful example of that. Um, but um, they enhance speech production primarily in pre-planned and predictable contexts or settings and during controlled activities. So they're not, so even the people that I worked with who use these devices well, often used other systems for face-to-face -face interactions with routine partners. Um, and you'll see that in the Hawkins Inc. book too. So we're arguing instead that we needed to turn our attention to theorizing what we mean by communication we're drawing on chat frameworks of distributed cognition. I think in the article, I, I highlight work by Hutchins and distributed communication, highlighting the work by Goffman. Um, the goal here is, is we're imagining that we need to support functional systems, not just individual users, but the individuals with disabilities and their communication partners. We want to mediate interactional alignments and the successful participation of people, all the people in the interaction in these communicative activities. So it's a novel approach that's aimed at supporting communicative interactions in less planned, less predictable contexts, um, and responsive to more emergent activities. So we used ethnographic data collection. This is typical of this kind of um, design um, phase of the divine design project. And then situated discourse analysis to study the communicative interactions in these spaces. So this article um, basically analyzes data from 16 on-campus interviews from six of these potential AAC PIM users, yielded a little over 11 hours of data for analysis. We had four observations with David. These are all pseudonyms three with Artemisia and with Iris, and two each with Chip, Gesture, and Jesse. 
Um, the data analysis then involved transcribing all these sessions, coding all the sessions for number of words and turns, as well as key interactional patterns of alignment among functional systems. And we used something that we've come to call interactional discourse resources, IDRs, which I'll explain in a minute and was also in the article. Um, and then we completed a situated analysis of selected interactions. So to map these you know, communicative activities, we started by coding the interactional discourse resources. So um, on pages 15 to 18, I have these detailed these operational definitions for these. But the important thing to think about is what we're trying to capture is those recognizable and robust discourse frames. And we've pulled these different ones from the um, literature on situated studies of communication. So for example, procedural discourse um, is um, moments or frames where you shift the participation structure to um, instead of conversational partners to an expert novice participation framework. Um, playful episodes, as we know, pulling on you know, early work of Ethan Bateson, is to shift to a non-serious key. So uh, he talked about the, um, the playful nip is a bite that denotes a play, not um, um, a fight stance that a bite might not normally display. So IDR episodes then were defined for, we operationalized that as these contiguous frames when the frame lasted for a while, right? So in other words, it was these temporarily sustained discourse frames around these different participation frameworks. So um, we can talk more about these if you have questions, um, but the first thing we did is just to count them, <laughs> identify them and count them. And table two just showed you those frequencies. So what was interesting to us is that what our team really expected to see is a lot of breakdowns, a lot of trouble sources. And T stands for trouble source. And if you look at the mean of the average per thousand words of these um, episodes we identified, trouble sources were not very high, only 2.16 episodes per thousand words across this whole data set. The one that surprised people is how much repetition. Now, anyone who has studied conversational repetition knows that it's pervasive and it's everywhere. We didn't count everything. We just looked at canonical words and those that clustered. So the repetition that went past about five, um, five turns, I think was our operational rule, um, didn't get counted as repetition. So we were really trying to look at these clustered moments of it. Even with this very narrow definition of it, um, it was by far the, the largest um, type of IDR that these, these people were um, organizing around. Okay, Paul? So the next thing we wanted to do is um, in terms of looking at um, these IDRs is to see how much alignment work the participants were managing across activity. So what we did is we designed these um, density maps. So here's just three examples of density maps um, that are in the article. And you'll see the very bottom row, I just give a broad label for the kind of activity that was going on. The next row from the bottom shows the page number. So we literally did a count for every page of the, of the transcript. So each page was about 40 seconds or about 50 words. So it's a rough estimate of, the um, of how these unfolded across time. And then we listed all the episodes that were coded on that page. So you get to see them stack up on that page. So across in the top one here is Artemisia. So on page one, you can see there's one, two, three repetitions, one D and one T that got coded on that page in that 50 sec in that 40 seconds of, of time. So what we start to see here is that across these maps, um, we identified over 200 codes. Um, with one to 14 of these codes um, and up to four IDRs listed per transcript page. That's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of frame shifting and managing things that are going on here. Um, also, I wanted to note that not captured on this is the complex ways that these IDRs were layered within the same strips of talk. So it was not unusual, for example, for there to be a lot of conversational repetition noted inside a narrative, for example. Um, 
It also, the more fleeting footings around talk that Goffman talks about, like production formats and participation frameworks, shifts in speakers or reported speech aren't captured here. So there's more alignment, more frame shifting than what is being captured in these, these charts. I just love this because people talk about, <laughs> You know, trying to simplify talk and clinical interaction, and I'm going. But this is this. This is what our patients are dealing with on the day day to day basis. This is what everyday talk looks like. It's like this. It's it's. I'm not going to say messy. I'm just going to say it's busy. It's busy. Okay, Paul. Um. So the the third thing we did. So we we did a basic count, and then we looked at how those um IDRs um displayed across time in those density maps. And then the third thing we did is to look at the role the PAs were playing, the personal assistants were playing, in supporting people, um, supporting interactions during strips of talk. So the analysis that's in the paper is from Jesse, who was a thirty year old doctoral student, and his PA, his personal assistant who were shopping at the tech store for clickers. Um, and um, the fact that you guys don't know what I'm talking about with clickers is exactly how this problem started out for them. <laughs> That's the trouble, trouble source that they started with. So in this short stretch of interaction around shopping at the tech store, we identified four interactional roles that Jesse's PA adopted to mediate these interactions. First, she simply tried to je translate Jesse's unintell unintelligible spoken word, clicker. So he couldn't say it very clearly. And so she just repeated it for the, um, for the um, clerk. That didn't fix it, okay? It was a simple, straightforward, you know, you couldn't say it, she fixed it, he got the right words out, the clerk still didn't know what we were talking about. So then she tried to clarify his meaning by doing an embodied enactment, using a presentation remote as an example, um, and acting like there's a screen in front of her and, and acting out advancing slides as a lecturer might do. Um, what, then the um, clerk got it. So then they went on to um, co-shopping. At this point, she just became enthusiastic. She goes, oh, that's really good. I, I could use one of those. I should look too. So she became a co-shopper with them as they went to the store. And at the end, um, they, she was a socializing friend as they joined together in a laugh of surprise when the clerk um, simply said the difference in these two models was their color. You know, Not a very techy answer for a tech store. So the rapidly shifting footings of the aid and her complex mediation of Jesse's shopping offer us an image of the kind of work that these PIMs, these pseudo intelligent mediators might be designed to help accomplish and begin to perhaps give us insight why traditional AAC devices um, are being abandoned by people. Paul, good. So I, I close with just some discussions um, moving between these three analyses lets us begin to sort of map the kind of communicative activity that these people are participating in in these functional systems as they move around campus. The frequency counts of these IDRs showed us the pervasiveness of repetition, the relative sparseness of trouble sources, and the considerable variation in the frequency rankings and codes across participants and across sessions or other activities. The density maps, which tracked both temporal shifts in, the, in broader activities and in use of the IDRs, made strikingly visible the amount of lamination characteristic of these everyday interactions. And the situated discourse analysis lets us track the detailed unfolding of interactions, the rapid emergent calibration of frames and the mediational roles of the PAs or the assistants, the aides. So take it together then, these empirical findings, all grounded in more of a chat perspective or distributed communication, call for PIMS, uh, which is our, our alternative to AAC, um, that should be actively reading and shaping the framing of talk, not just producing strips of talk or messages. Have dialogic capacities, in other words, be able to reference past histories and remind us of things, to be able to engage as partners in discourse, 
participating in episodes of play, narrative, procedural discourse, and so on, and should be designed for agility. In other words, be able to recognize and navigate rapidly shifting and laminated discursive frames. We also believe that outside of supporting AAC, that taking up research with differently abled persons has significant implications for chat, going beyond the early um, contributions of Vygotsky and Luria to really challenge these implicit assumptions about normative bodies and inter interchangeable subjects of activity. And then finally, designing AAC devices to support the participation of diverse communicators in everyday interactions can begin to help us remake social cultural worlds as our repeated and routine engagement accustoms the everyday worlds of dining halls, tech stores, homes, and workplaces to the communicative participation of differently abled individuals. Okay, Paul? So um, just to sum up, I've got two slides left and we'll then go to questions. Um, some key connections between Julie's um, work and, and paper and, and, and mine and Anna Smith's. Um, first, that dialogic and situated perspectives entail flat architectures and close attention to the dynamic and emerging characteristics of lived moments. Um, second, that interactions are dialogically and semiotically mediated. And um, there's been an um, overfocus on language and the role of language. And language often gets credited with much more than it can accomplish. Um, that becoming involves historical chains of interaction. And we call for approaches that attend to becomings and change in both humans and non-humans, rather than learning, uh, because that term tends to invoke narrower kind of transmission framings of, of what's happening. Um, and we've been very interested recently in Karen Barad's work, um, which we also think is implicit in the long tradition developing from Bogotsky, that methodology should be a matter of ethical onto epistemological matters, not a question of just epistemology. The fundamental questions are our ontology, our theories of what's happening in this phenomena and our ethical orientation to what kind of a society we want to develop. Um, okay, that didn't go, here we go. Uh, just a brief mention of some current directions and projects. Um, one thing we've been very interested in recently is thinking about enriched communicative environments, both for becoming and for social justice. Um, work on ontology of moments, uh, drawing from Lemke, prepare Giovanni and becoming and understanding situated historical and embodied semiosis. Um, I've listed here uh, four sources. Two of them are already uh, published um, by Julie where, uh, and then Julie, Melissa and Teresa Jones which are, are talking about these enriched communicative environments and how we can create them by enhancing uh, compl meaningful complexity, um, agency and uh, optimization for individuals. That that's what creates rich environments for people. And we think this is a powerful notion. It's, it's really incredibly well supported in studies of animals and humans <laughs> um, as, a, as a way of creating health and better learning and recovery from injury. Uh, with a group of people and uh, Julie and I, and I believe Bruce and of course Larissa uh, are here today. We're working on this piece on Per Giovanni and Becoming and rearticulating theory and methodology for embodied dialogic semiotic flat chat assemblage. It's still in progress and that title might change. And then Julie and I are also working with Andrea Olinger on a book now under contract at De Gruder uh, involving situated historical embodied semiosis, a unified framework for semiotic activity. So that kind of gives you an idea of where we're going beyond these, these somewhat earlier articles. Um, and I will stop sharing now and um, we can open up for questions. Thank you all for your attention. Round of applause, people. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> Thank you very much. Very good for us to recap uh, all the information we got from the articles and also for people who could have problems in understanding to get. Thank you very much. Arisa, uh, now it's up to you for initiating the discussions, the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Julie, again. It was really great to hear you. Um, I've read these papers some many times. <laughs> 
I remember reading Julia's article for the first time when I was in the U.S. because we were supposed to have a conversation. And I remember having like, oh, my God, what is happening? And do I understand what is what is going on? Because it was so challenging in terms of changing the perspective of how I was trained to see language and interaction. So uh, yesterday when I was talking to Fernanda, it was really exciting because I felt like I was much more comfortable explaining to her <laughs> what was happening, you know? Um, so it was, it was great to hear you all. And I'm thinking about the questions. Some of the questions I think there were um, already addressed somehow maybe partially we could start the conversation but I, I i was wondering if Zé, who wrote a question would like to ask uh your question or um fair if you would like to ask your question maybe Zé could start and then do, do you want me to i can share the question with everyone and then you can explain the question Zé. What, what do you prefer yeah, you can you can share that. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Professor uh, Paul and Julie for being with us. Um, well, I I I guess my question, uh, as Larissa mentioned, was partially answered. I I was uh, very interested in the first article, right, the perspective on transliteracies development, and then. Uh, uh, the question is also something that I'm uh, thinking uh, about my research, right? Considering this uh, heterogeneity and movement that we have in this transliteracies perspective. So um, I will read what I wrote because it, it was kind of confusing for me to understand, but then I can explain better. So mm -hmm. although transliteracies refer to heterogeneity and movement, we might not have a broader view of the whole process as it entails due to the diversity involved in personal experiences. So maybe just that specific moment in class can give the teacher an idea of how learning is unfolding. So I would like to hear from you how uh, do you understand that learning sparkle as part of the whole historical and personal movement one is immersed in, right? I personally ask this question because I, uh, I myself heard people mentioning that in terms of the research turning into something too subjective, right? That might happen. So, and maybe it would be difficult to depict more general facts. I understand that, um, when you mention this uh, subjective aspect or the perspective of the experience, uh, the idea is uh, exactly not to generalize it, but how do you react to this criticism that if you might have it or not? I don't know if I explained well. Yeah, yeah. And um, I would say a couple things. Thanks for the question. Um, I do think that you know, uh, one of the things I, I kind of would pick up on is this question about how difficult it is. Um, and, and Julie and I have both had lots of conversations about like this idea that somehow studying humans could be simple. <laughs> um, you know, we know how difficult it is for physicists to study particles of matter. Um, we should expect that it's gonna be difficult and complex, um, not simple. Uh, about it being too subjective, I, and thinking about implications of transliteracies, I think for educational contexts and things like this, I, I would go back to say that, you know, when I interview Nora, for example, um, she credits her biology classes, uh, K through 12, or her science classes with almost none of the things that were important to her. Um, her husband, who is now actually on faculty at Cornell, um, basically described how he got into biology by working in a fish store, a pet store. <laughs> um, part of the point is, is human learning is subjective. It's a matter of personal becoming, it's history, it, it, it's trajectories and change that the people are, are working through. Um, and I think if Anna were here, one of the things she would probably point to is a, a line of work around connected learning which emphasizes 
this perspective that that you know what happens is not a transmission of a curriculum to students, but really a, a co-inquiry and co-development based in students' lives and and taking their interests and their orientations and their perspectives as the base for moving forward rather than thinking that you know like, we just have to cram everything into the into the students. Um, so I think it, you know, in, in some respects, I would argue that the transliteracy's perspective is precisely saying that we have to attend to students' um, individual becoming uh, through their histories. And of course, their individual becoming is never purely individual. It's always social. It's always historical. Um, but you know, uh, Nora was watching kids' TV shows and reading kids' nature books. <laughs> You know, and that was really critical to her. She spent tons of time with these little pop-up books with, you know, parrots and iguanas and things like that, you know, just in, inhabiting this imaginative universe. And that was what propelled her into biology. Um, her science classes actually turned her off. Um, they were some of her least favorite classes until she got into advanced labs in college. So I don't know if that addresses your question, but, but those would be some quick responses. Julie, do you have? Yeah, I, this, I'm really glad you asked that question because thinking about this difference between subjective and objective has just been a huge part of my professional life, both clinically and in my research. Um, and I think too often they're used categorically as totally separate. And they're used as a code. And I think you got to this with your question as one's generalizable and one's not. And I, I just have, I question both of those assumptions. I think the problem with that, uh, that understanding of it is it tends to um, cool off everything. It gets rid of the effective dimensions of things because the effective dimensions are by definition um, individual, right? <laughs> you respond to something different than I respond to it. So I think it's cutting off, you know, a good half of, of the human becoming when we try to divorce things from the affective dimensions part of it. Um, the other thing is I, you know, the generalizable, if we think that's more like the central tendencies or what we can expect from populations or groups or particular, um, never accounts for everybody. <laughs> And with my work on um, disability, um, I always feel like the vast majority of the people that I'm working with and studying are not included in those generalizable findings. <laughs> they're, they're outside of them. And so I have gravitated toward um, very rich ethnographic situated interpretive case studies with the idea being until we can understand the full range of particulars that are at our our disp human disposal that are part of the human condition, then we don't know what that central tendency is capturing or missing, right? Um, so yeah, I, I struggle with this. Clinically, that's used to say basically whose perspective you're using. The medical, percept um, the medical perspective, like the, the, the diagnostic category, the labels, my reading, my labs, versus the the client's perspective, the patient's perspective. So they're just use it to separate whose point of view we're taking and whose matters. And then that pits them against each other. I don't know, do, does any of this I, get what you're thinking about? Could I jump in for a second? I, I, I think picking up on Julie's point, um, this conversation about generalizability has become a, a critical problem. Um, you know, that, it, it, if you go back to D.T. Campbell, who was one of the leading statisticians and uh, empirical researchers of the 20th century, um, two things he argued. One is that you can generalize from cases, um, which is really fascinating. He didn't think you could, but as he thought about all the different variables that were brought in, he, he came up actually with the notion of triangulation that we've heard about a lot in, in ethnographic studies. They said, you know, essentially triangulation creates like degrees of freedom in cases um, that allow for generalization. Um, the other thing he said is actually, if you're only doing a single statistical test, you don't have any idea what's going on. <laughs> you know, uh, you need to do like a whole bunch of triangulation of, of statistical quantitative data 
to have a real understanding of whether what you think is happening is what's happening. Um, so, you know, I, I also, Julie pointed me to a book by Todd Rose called The End of Average, which, which kind of beautifully makes this point she just gave of, you know, the ways in which um, this over-focus on central tendency leads to really problematic interpretations. So for example, in medical contexts, um, you know, you, you may have nobody who fits right at the mean <laughs> that's, that all the service is being delivered at. You know, um, people aren't means, people are individuals with their own histories and every bell curve has like huge spread, right? So um, if you're treating a mean, there might actually be nobody at the mean, literally nobody. Um, and that I think is, is a really useful counter to this kind of like, you know, you need to generalize and, and cases aren't generalizable. I just don't accept that. Hmm. That, that reminds me of uh, Kung Lian, the normal and the pathological. He talks about the brain as well, as we have the average brain that actually doesn't represent any brain. <laughs> so that kind of goes with what um, Paul was talking. Um, so another question is from Sara. Sara, uh, você quer falar sua pergunta ou eu traduzo? Oi, boa tarde. Pode fazer, pode, pode fazer em português. Pode, pode traduzir, por favor, Lari. Não, você pode fazer em português, Sara, porque ele vai ouvir pelas intérpretes. Então, você fala que ele está ouvindo não a sua voz, ele vai ouvir as intérpretes. Ok. Só um momento, por favor. So, Paul e Julie, se você quiser mudar para inglês. Just did. Oh, my God. Você pode falar em português, Sara, porque ele vai te ouvir. Ah, ok. Ele não está nem te escutando mais, ele só vai ouvir a intérprete. Ah, entendi. Então, é, sobre o texto, eu achei muito interessante é, a discussão a, e a respeito de como é trabalhado o trans literacies. É, e poderia também comparar, compará-lo com os multiletramentos, com o multiletramento engajado, tendo em vista a, funda a fundamentação teórica do desenvolvimento humano inserido em uma perspectiva vigotskiana de vir a ser. Né? É, então, considerando o um ambiente escolar como palco para, essas intera para interações, para ações, como esse projeto seria trabalhado em, no contexto de uma escola pública, no, no, em um contexto pandêmico, em uma escola pública? Não sei se eu fui muito clara. Um, ok, I just, I turned off translation and I, I, I think I... I think I got it. Um, um, I'm not entirely sure uh, how engaged multiliteracies, uh, you know, uh, what that means precisely. Um, it's it, multiliteracies is a term I'm familiar with, um, but um, and engaged. But I'm not entirely sure what that what that perspective would look like. Um, I would say that that the transliteracies perspective is definitely drawing on Vygotsky and <laughs> dialecto-materialist perspectives on education. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking about how uh, we aim to transform reality through our activities um, and, and develop. In how would this apply in public schools now? I, I think I began to discuss that um, with the earlier question and thinking about connected learning. Um, I would say that Uh, one thing is is obviously not to think that um, linguistic means are the only means, not to think that there are um, compulsory discourses that people need to comply with and, and obey, um, but that you know there are um, worlds that people can participate in, um, and to aim to uh, you know 
connect with students from where they are coming from and to engage in co-inquiry and co-learning with them. And um, this again is actually a, an idea that Julie um, first um, shared with me in, in, uh, in our family. Um, you know, uh, I ended up doing birding with Nora. I grew up in a city and when I was growing up, I didn't know birds at all. <laughs> um, so I didn't first study birds and then teach Nora. Nora and I learned together. Um, you know, sit there with books open going through is what bird is that? What its colors? How do you use this book and things like that? And that was a tremendous basis for learning. So I would say that in a, in a pandemic or not, um, the implications of this transliteracy perspective is to take up a more open uh, idea to building connections um, and building histories with your students. Um, and being open to learning from them as well as, and with them as well as, as to teaching them. Um, and I think that, that, that those are what I would say are the central, um, you know, uh, uh, points I would, I, would, I would connect to your question. Mais, mais alguma pergunta, Fer, quer selecionar? Fer, do you want to choose one of your questions, your favorite question, maybe the question you want to... I will ask one, but I will connect my question to the explanation of what engaged multiliteracies are. So, so Paul, because uh, it's, it's, it's obvious that you, you still don't know because we haven't published anything in English about it. <laughs> It's a recent uh, concept that we have developed. Um, we depart from uh, the Freudian's perspective of engagement with reality, with immersion in reality, and uh, with Vygotsky's idea of the double movement of the necessary uh, connection with everyday concepts, and also with the decolonized perspective of, of what is knowledge, how we how we see uh, decolonizing schools and turning schools into a place of living and feeling and expressing who we are and not only creating a big enormous head full of knowledge and uh, cognitive development. So this is the the basic for our ideas, and we use. Uh, the New London Group idea of multiliteracy because we see connections, but because we have a Vygotskyan tradition in the Freudian tradition, our reading of the, the, the multi, multiliteracy is different. So we call it engaged in the sense that what we work with is to reflect about our social reality very much in tune. And I'm very interested with in your in your article on, on in your work on social justice because we depart from injustice from very oppressive context. For example, this week we did uh, we had a class on racism and how people uh, deal with racist situations. So we create environments for people to live this. So we created, for example, um, in one situation, the theater of the oppressed with, from Augusto Boal. I don't know if you are familiar with this, but that's a, the same line, same line of, of the pedagogy of the oppressed by Paulo Freire. And uh, we work with scenes from real life where people are oppressed and students are invited to intervene with their own knowledge, with their own backgrounds, ideas, feelings, revolt in order to try to change that. And from that moment that we capture students' attentions, lives, interests, interest, feelings, we move into reflecting about what are the different uh, ways we can understand this problem bringing for because it's school life so from a mathematical perspective a linguistic perspective and all these areas contributing to this so teachers can see how to connect real life experiences that the students leave to the contents they need to teach so that's what Sara was talking about. And then what is more important for us after this process of understanding how contents can help them understand and deal with this situation, they have to create some form of reaction in society. They have to, to create something 
they have that's what Paul Freire would call insertion. They have to take responsibility for doing something in relation to that situation of oppression. And in this sense, um, and then I will put my question for both of you, it, because that's what I what I what we mean by funds of Perejivani. People connect in very dramatic moments. And that's what I asked Paul about, how he, he traced those situations with Nora, if, if the dramatic events were some of the issues that he used to trace this. And, uh, and I also asked Julie about this idea that uh, when, you, when you connect, when you come to these different environments and you participate in these conversations, um, what you mobilize is not only linguistic, but it's all the repertoire in the sense that Brigitta says, all your history, your emotions, your body movement. For me, for example, who knows me knows that I have a lot of gestures and, and facial expressions and, and tone of voice. So all of this is mobilized as part of the resources I have constructed and that are part of my repertoire because they are part of my history and I can choose from them to create meaning within this context, the context of this activity. And uh, uh, so for us, this is very essential. We try to analyze what are the, the traces of this repertoire that is being developed through the process I, I mentioned in engaged multiliteracy. So my question for you is, how do you connect this to this idea of a flat chat? Because we have uh, we have followed many different traditions, including the the triangles for many re reasons. Although I complete, I told Larissa in in through chat why we were prefer very good example. He got me because this example is horrible. These triangles he used there because you put the the patient as an object, and I have discussed with Yuri that that's horrible thing to see the patient as a and not as a subject, but. But uh, the triangle itself, I like to think about it. And I have a, a, a picture that we use. I forgot the name because it's in physics and I don't understand. But that is the triangle moving into a ball because a balls are created of triangles You can, in, 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 I don't know, in geometry. I don't know what, but, uh, and, and that's how I see it. There is no triangle itself. There is a combination of different things that creates the totality of what we live. So I look at a triangle, but I see it just as part of a totality and uh, participants in it as part of many different activities in life. But when I do my research, and that's my question for you, I select some triangles or some activities for me to put focus on. And because I am a linguist and that because I want to see transformation, I put my emphasis on dramatic events that take place within the activities, because for me, they are the changing points, as Vygotsky said, the turning points for us to see development and to, uh, to visualize possibilities of creativity emerging. So how do you see this connected to what you said? And that's a very long explanation, I'm sorry. I said I was not going to ask it here because I want to have a private conversation with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me start while I can still remember it, then I'll, I'll make Paul have to answer second. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, first of all, thank you so much for that explanation. That really helps a lot in me thinking about how to how to sort of respond and participate in the conversation. So I appreciate that. Um, I, you know, a couple of things as you were saying, as a linguist, you're interested in 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 the sort of the full enactment of language with this, and and that is one of the reasons that I have shifted to, from saying I study discourse, not language, very much for that reason. Clearly, I'm interested in how language is one of many communicative resources at our disposal, and that's part of it. Um, so yes, I'm, I agree, and I and I like this. I I don't know her work that you mentioned, um, um, but I'll I'll look it up now. You have me intrigued. Um, mm -hmm. That you know the the interesting thing that I liked about what you said and what you wrote in your question is that there really is sort of a, almost a biological neurological reality to what she's talking about, right? That, that 
one of the ways I often described it to my students is we need to think about bodies as being the sort of bio um, artifact of Genesis. We, we, through our experiences in the world, our bodies is actually enact and, and put down traces of it in the same way that we build and sculpt devices and other artifacts, right? So yes, there's, there's nothing in the neuroscience right now um, that would say that there's anything that is so modular that it's not constantly being um, sort of orchestrated and co-occurring co, um, with other things. So yeah, I, I, to me, that is part of the flatness of all of this, right? There's no hierarchy. There's no central operator. There's, you know, so it fits with that. Um, and there was one other thing I was going to say, and oh, the other thing that I think is really important for a starting point, I, I absolutely agree. We can't, we can't necessarily do all of it. Like you said, you start with a triangle, you pick a concept. Um, but to me, what we need to remember or know is that those are our thinking tools. Those are our methodological tools. They're not what we are actually studying. And the first way to sort of protect um, ourselves from um, you know, being too redu reductive is to recognize that we are looking at a part and to have enough of a concept of the whole, if you will, to be able to know how and to interpret what we're doing. So yeah, very, very interesting. Okay, now Paul, do you remember what you wanted to say? Um, sure, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. Um, first, I think, uh, thanks for the explanation of engaged multiliteracies. Um, I think in, in, in terms of what you've been talking about here with the kind of anti-racist decolonial uh, perspective with, with one that engages in the lived realities of students and aims to transform society that um, Anna Smith, I can speak for her right now, would sign on completely. <laughs> you know, that uh, Amy Stoney, Aldo, Nathan Phillips, that, that that is what they're talking about doing and in their um, projects in schools um, that, that tends to be the way. And, and part of looking at the extracurricular activity of spoken word as Anna did with UW is, is, a, is a development of that and thinking about how that remediated um, you know, people's lived experiences um, and became critical to their ongoing becoming. Um, so, so yes, I think, I think there's strong resonances with what we're arguing for and, and this engaged multiliteracies perspective. And I look forward uh, to reading it in, in, in English or you know, in, the, in the near future. Um, I would or say having Larissa other, translate it for us, right? Having Larissa, Larissa translate it, yeah. She's we have some articles that. that are in pre, 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 pre you know, this thing. Yeah, <laughs> pre -print. Pre -print. And then I will send it to you so you can right, give you. some feedback and we can change some things. <laughs> And I would also uh, add two things, and, and I think we're kind of running up against time, so I'll try to be pretty quick here. Um, one is, you know- Don't worry, this... Paul, don't worry, don't worry. Okay, it, okay. It, we are okay. Don't okay. Um, one is, when I started thinking about flat chat, um, part of what I was doing was exactly what you started doing there, of saying, well, like, okay, you've got a subject who's the teacher and the student is the object, but there's also a view where you take the perspective of the student and the student has their own triangle, right? They're doing things in school. They're not just there. And not just one student, but every single student in that room, right? So suddenly you've got like all these triangles. And then the second thing is this fundamental concept of lamination, that from moment to moment to moment, um, different scenes are being invoked and brought to the fore. Somebody tells a story. Um, Julie's example in, um, uh, the outlines paper of the PA enacting, uh, you know, doing the clicker and doing a presentation. That is a scene, not just language. You know, the language actually failed. She said clickers <laughs> and the tech thought it was uh, a device to kind of like uh, register uh, responses to the teacher, right? An, an eye clicker. Um, and uh, you know, so she enacted doing a presentation and kind of like the screen and everything like that. So the other thing is that even in a classroom, even in a short stretch of interaction and Julie's density maps start to suggest this, there are multiple scenes, multiple indexical fields, multiple indexical grounds being invoked and assembled and reassembled and disassembled, right? And contested. Um, so it's that tremendous complexity and fluidity 
that I think complicates like how does the triangle handle that um, in the course of a single interaction with the doctor. Um, multiple scenes are going to be construed and constructed. Um, and from the perspective of the lived realities and histories of the people in that room, which are never, you know, I've, I've said teachers are never just teachers. Students are never just students, right? Um, doctors are never just doctors. You can't do that. That's not humanly possible. Um, so you have to take all of that in, into, into account when you're, when you're thinking about what's happening. Um, so yeah, so I, I think I think those are are some of my my my, my quick responses to that. And um, you owe me a conversation because <laughs> I have so many questions that I have to ask. <laughs> let, me, let me explain something. She wants to be convinced. No, but <laughs> okay. tell me this. I want to talk to them about the creative chain and how it fits within this because we never talk about subject as only the students. We always talk about students parents and teachers and coordinators as in, in the activity of teaching and learning. And the object is learning how to live in, in society and instruments are so many. So, so perhaps that's something uh, I tend and we, our group, because we work with multiple groups all over the world, we tend to read what the other people write according to what we want. And we recreate <laughs> it very, <laughs> into what we want so perhaps that's part of i have been doing but I, I i will send to you some text and i want to read more on the recent ones as you presented so that we can have our conversation and i think that we are going to do great things together in the future i have plans <laughs> look, <laughs> look forward to it thank you so much Thank you very much, Julie. Thank you, Paul. Larissa always says that you are great and you are very nice and sweet and, and she's right. It's great to be with you. It was a pleasure. I'm sure they are very much enthusiastic about this conversation and we will have plenty of things to talk and they will keep on talking and talking about what you presented today. So thank you very much and we will have more chances to be together, hopefully sometime in the future not only through these media, but also yeah. here in Brazil. <laughs> Thank you very much. A round of applause. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. too. For, oh, um, creating Thank you, this people forum. on the internet. We are going now to have our picture. Bye. <laughs>